Hello everyone. We're just about to get started with another round of the Prompt Craft Guidebook Workshop. This is Entry Level Getting Started. We are going to be diving in very shortly into getting started with Prompt Craft. Welcome and thanks for joining me here. This is Evo Haining. Hi, and great to see you. We are going to be doing a one hour workshop here together. I am going to go ahead and bring us into a shared dialogue today of how to get started into your generative media tools. Uh, we're going to give everyone just a few moments to get settled here. The tools that we're going to be using today, including your live streaming window, uh, might include either Midjourney on Discord or a Stable Diffusion window on your web browser. So uh, be planning for having one of those tools available to you today. And we're going to go through how to get started in just a moment. Thanks for joining me here. And thank you for picking up the uh the book and for everything else as i've been getting those comments and thank you i see you out in the audience great to see you here today so this is an ongoing workshop i'm going to go ahead and bring in our slides uh this is prompt craft one getting started i'm going to go ahead and pull myself out but you'll still hear me please let me know if you are having trouble with my audio for any reason I realize I've got a little bit of background noise here today. I'm going to go ahead and pull out that background music. And that way we can have a little bit of a conversation today. So uh, we are going to be doing a one hour webinar on getting started with generative media tools. Um, I'm going to be bringing you into a couple of different tools including Stable Diffusion and Midjourney. Um, and we're also going to discuss some of the other types of tools out there. So uh, while we are not getting into the nitty gritty of machine learning and prompt engineering today, this is an introduction to writing for prompt craft. Specifically, how do you write a prompt? What kinds of tools would you be using? How do you form those? And what kinds of language tips are you looking for? So we're going to be exploring a wide variety, uh, starting with Midjourney, looking at the types of language and the types of grammar you might be wanting to use. Uh, we're going to look at some prompt tools and resources. We are going to briefly discuss things like parameters and weights and measures, aspect ratios. And then at the end, I think we're going to have just a few minutes today to talk about other writing tools, for example, ChatGPT and other uh, out their resources. Now, there are over a thousand AI tools out there, more coming every day. Uh, some of them are already baked into your existing workflows. And so we're going to take a little bit of time for questions and your questions are always appreciated. If you are seeing the comment line, then you can send me a question that way and I can bring it into the show. So thank you for joining me here today. Uh, this is Evo Haining at RealityCraft. RealityCraft is a gallery design lab in Oakland, California, uh, East Bay, just across the bay from San Francisco. And we focus on generative creativity, generative world building, helping people understand how to use these tools effectively, understanding that these are tools for turning your vision into something that is realized, whether that's an image or a production, something that is finished. So I want you to be thinking about the inquiry you're asking yourself in this process and the actions and the decisions that you're going to be making, not just for yourself, but for those that are going to experience your work down the road as well. So we are going to discuss some of the, uh, the nuances of how do you learn to work with these tools within your own existing creative process. So uh, there is nothing in this course that is designed to diminish the amazing creativity that all of you are already bringing to the table. Uh, whether you're watching me live right now or later on, I just want to encourage you to keep creating from that space of vision. Here at Reality Craft, we guide that process through 
a game, a design lab, and also a physical gallery. We have a physical space where we combine the generative tools that we're going to see here today with real physical art making. And that can be for a wide variety of things like television, film, theatrical, publishing. Uh, some of you have reached me because you have come up with a new book. And so prompt craft specifically, the course that we are here for today and this book is a process to help you realize and design your generative creative works. <clears throat> To be clear, that includes not only language in the form of words, but it also includes images. We have things that are image to image, uh, but also that includes things like emoji, things that we haven't necessarily qualified as language up to this point. So certain tools are going to be able to work with different types of information effectively in different ways. We're gonna explore some of that today. So just to summarize, a prompt is a series of words, numbers, and other characters that express an idea that can be generated. A prompt can include a mix of characters that speak to all of these elements potentially. So you might see a prompt written in a tool for image generation or for, for writing as well <clears throat> that is more like 50 words long. It is because they are speaking to all five of these things in that prompt. They are prompting for a content type. They are letting an image generator know to give me something that looks like a poster or a sticker or an infographic or a, uh, a landscape portrait. These kinds of uh, ideas that express the type of content give a specific type of constraint to the generator. Description are all of those beautiful descriptive words that we usually come up with when we're thinking about a scene. If we're going to describe a scene in front of us, we might say, uh, a beautiful sunny day, the mountains in the background, and beautiful golden trees in the foreground, right? So that's describing a scene. That description, we then bring down to as few words as possible, we get rid of the articles, and we make those, in some cases, comma separated so that the generator can then work with those and parse them as individual things within a scene or an object. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the ways in which you're going to use nouns, verbs, adjectives, and such in that process in a moment. The third thing here, style, is specifically uh, can reference an art style, let's say impressionism, surrealism. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, 3D methods of art making now replicated in tools like Midjourney and Stable Diffusion. So quilling and paper art or sculptural uh, forms. I like to do stained glass because stained glass is a very painful physical uh, art to make. And it's very satisfying to be able to create something that is beautiful without spending a hundred hours and, and breaking your hands. So those sorts of um, media play often come into style. And then you have composition. And composition words will often be the kinds of words you would take from stage direction or from a theater script, uh, a TV script. If you read a script and you're going to read that top entry before every act or every scene, it's going to describe a little bit of the composition potentially for a cinematographer. They might say uh, an establishing shot with two people, and, and they're also going to give some clue to maybe whether it's centered or not centered, um, what is potentially most important to focus on, or maybe something is out of focus. Um, so there are a wide variety of words here that you might use, including language from photography or videography, from stage, um, or from other art media as well to help guide the composition process. And then finally, we're going to talk more deeply about parameters, but parameters um, help constrain and give the uh, the algorithm that's doing the generation at the end of the day needs to know, for example, is there an aspect ratio that I'm trying to deliver to, or is there a quality that you are looking for? 
So uh, we're going to explore both Stable Diffusion and Midjourney. You can take your pick today. Midjourney uh, only gives you a certain number of images, and then you will need to pay for it. Uh, Stable Diffusion, many of the tools out there on the web are also uh, free for a little while, and then you need to pay for credits. Uh, there are a handful of completely open tools out there. And in the book, there are some of those listed uh, some of them are still being developed and released. So things like Open Journey, Blue Willow, uh, you might wanna try Playground AI as well. These are tools that are available to you if you're looking to try something and maybe need to bounce around to a few different tools to find the right thing for you. So uh, just to get started, if you have not gotten started before, you can go to midjourney.com or you can go to uh, diffusion.land is one tool that you could use today or dreamstudio.ai. Uh, we're going to do both of those uh, for just a few moments. So I would encourage you, this is one that's quite easy to use, dreamstudio.ai. We do have separate videos that dive deeper into some of that as well. So if you're looking for more of that, you can check out the rest of the videos on this channel and they might help you get there. I'm going to slow down here and give you time to ask questions. So if you're getting stuck at any process point along the way, we're going to be diving into mid-journey. And I'm going to be watching the comments here, but I want you to go ahead and let me know if you need me to stop and give you some time on something in particular. As I mentioned, mid-journey does give you a, a free trial edition. It's going to be relatively limited. So uh, if you're trying that for the first time, you're going to have, I think, 25 images, something like that. Every time you generate, you're going to be creating a grid of four images. And that's what we're going to see right now as I'm going to be bringing in our window from Midjourney. So uh, for those of you who haven't used Midjourney before, it works inside Discord. Not everyone is used to that. So um, I'm going to be bringing in Discord here. Uh, what you're seeing is a direct message I'm having with the Discord bot. Now, when you come into Midjourney in Discord, you're going to be coming into the channel. The channel is um, it's a very loud space where there are hundreds of thousands of people engaging at the same time. So there are public rooms where you can go and generate. Um, but you can also go to uh, sort of a newbies getting started channel, or if you have your direct messages turned on in Discord, and that's very important, you have to turn those direct messages on, you can then have a direct message as I'm doing here with a Discord mid-journey bot. So basically, I'm having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a bot doing my generation in a window without necessarily sharing that with the rest of the world. Now, <clears throat> there's reasons to want to work in public and there's reasons to want to work in private. Uh, for what we're doing today, it's just a lot easier to have a, a relatively private channel because uh, we're going to go through what each of these tools do and how to use them. And I want you to be able to know how to manipulate that for yourselves. And my apologies, we've got a street cleaner going outside right now. So what you're seeing in front of me with these four images, I then uh, prompted from what was a blended image. I took two images and some words, and then I, at the end, I put these parameters. What you're seeing with the two dashes at the end, uh, those are parameters specific for the mid-journey bot. So what you're seeing here, the U1, U2, U3, U4, V1, V2, V3, and V4. U in this case stands for upscale. So I can hit U1 and it's going to upscale and give me a higher res version of that. It's basically gonna fill in some of these gaps because when I get a first version, I'm getting something in the 256 pixel area under 512. And that's not really uh, enough information for me for doing something large. So then at this point, I would maybe pick one or two of the images I think is, is higher quality and then potentially upscale to go larger. That's going to give me more detail. It will fill in some detail potentially with more realism. It might not give me the kind of detail I'm looking for. And so I'm also going to show you what the V does here. V stands for variation. And so what I'm doing here when I click on variation is I am going to see four new versions of that image. So U1 is this corner, 
U2, U3, U4, same V1. So I'm going to, if I want to do a variation of this one, I'm going to click V1. And at this point, I'm going to do something called a remix. And a remix lets me add information to this prompt. Now, there may be reason why I want to pull out information. Uh, I don't want to use a name. I don't want to, you know, have too much uh, competing information. Maybe this prompt is too complex, and so I'm not getting exactly what I'm looking for. So a remix could be an add of information or a reducing of information. Uh, this might be a place where you could add uh, a lighting cue or a quality information point. Um, or you could spin it in a different direction and maybe say, add a human, say, I need a human in this scene. So we'll try that next. I'm going to get back a couple of different images now. You'll notice that these generation times are taking uh, in the range of around a minute per generation. Uh, Mid-journey, I think, says they average around 50 seconds. So uh, your mileage may vary with other tools. Some tools take quite a few minutes to get to that. And honestly, we, we can look at some tools like uh, Blockade Labs on Skyboxes, where you're going to take a few minutes per image, but you're going to get like a fully panoramic 360. So uh, this image now, we're going to get something that's larger than a 512. And I can certainly decide maybe I do want to download this and work with it and take it off to another program to edit it. Or maybe I want to continue to create variation. So uh, maybe the words are still, there's, there's too many words here, too much. I'm going to get rid of everything uh, that feels extraneous because we've got too much information here. It's just not getting the, uh, the sort of quality of the home I'm looking for perhaps. So if the prompt is too complex, it's not going to uh, be able to bring all of those pieces into the image cohesively. It's not going to know what to do with the information. So if I'm throwing too much at it in the prompt, at some point it will break down. And I wanted to give you some sense of how that looked and how that worked. But one thing I'm going to need to show you very quickly is uh, if you are not able to remix when you come into Midjourney, it is a settings choice that turns that on. So um, I'm, I'm really excited about some of these things that are coming out here. I think we might have a good doorway on number three, and we might have something to work with on number two, but I want to have the doorway. And I want to really focus on that doorway. So uh, let's think about maybe that worked, maybe that didn't, but I wanted you to see what the variation process is bringing, right? So in some cases, certain types of information stayed in. In some cases, it's trying to throw new information to fill in a gap. So we're going to go back to our slides here, and I'm glad to see a few of you watching in person, and thanks for joining me live. I am here live with you now. It's great to see you. If you are struggling with uh, some of these pieces along the way, please feel free to ask questions. So if you are watching asynchronously, the comment line, also a great place to ask questions too. Uh, this course is being turned into a larger course that you can go ahead and subscribe to for all of these video modules in one place. So I'll be sure to send you that link uh, in the future. So we just looked at a mid-journey prompt, and I wanted to show you the three elements of a mid-journey prompt very quickly so that you understand those together. What you're looking at when you're looking at the slash imagine line, that is the first thing I type when I go to prompt in mid-journey, I type slash imagine, and that is the command that the bot recognizes to start the prompt. Other tools don't require this. This is specific to the Midjourney bot because you are giving a bot commands. And so it needs to understand what the command is. Um, in this way, writing for prompts is a little bit like learning code. Like you're learning a new secret code that lets you talk to bots in special ways. So I just want to give you that um, sort of narrative structure for how you're organizing your thoughts because bots do speak differently than humans do. So uh, the kinds of language that you're going to get from ChatGPT, for example, may or may not work well if you copy and paste it as your text prompt 
in this case. We've seen a lot of people trying that out and it doesn't always work well. ChatGPT does not understand how to form a prompt well. And so it will often come up with something that is more confused than you could do on your own. And I want you to really think about how you would frame a scene before you jump into a generative tool to do that work for you. So think about all of these pieces of the puzzle as being building blocks that you are going to put together. In this case, there are image prompts. Uh, Midjourney can take up to five images at once and blend them together. And we just saw uh, an image that was blended from two specific previous images. Uh, but a lot of the things I've been working on lately in terms of my own uh, my own prompt craft and exploration includes blended images. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And we also covered that in the advanced topics course. So exercise one, getting started. I want you to practice writing prompts that might surprise you. I want you to think about the element of surprise. So start with three words. It can be up to five, but three is a place to start that may not have anything to do with each other. But you're going to want to think about one of them is deeply descriptive. One of them should probably be a style word, like a, an art style, in this case, surrealist. Um, and, and think about things that are conceptual or interesting, words that help people reflect or might, uh, might make them ask a question. So in this case, the prompt was confused, surrealist dripping. Uh, what you would type is, slash imagine prompt that prompt automatically comes up in the window and you type in confused surrealist dripping and this is what you get this is also what you get and so we're going to explore for example if you keep making variations basically you keep pushing v1 v2 v3 v4 or you re-roll from mid-journey what do you get because in this case the surrealist path I did probably a selection of 250 images over the course of a day. And many of them were just following my creative intuition to say, okay, I love the color scape of this woman with the dripping paint on her face, right? But it's completely different than this guy who's almost sort of exploding and uh, figuring out, for example, how to work with remixing in order to get to that place. Uh, we're going to talk about that next. So variation, that was the one piece we just did. You can see how that comes together with those crystalline cats. And I'm going to show you what those crystalline cats ended up looking like, because um, what I did was start them in mid-journey. And then I took them out and I trained them in a second tool called Scenario to make them into specific characters. So for that promo, these characters were basically blended between 50 of these original crystalline cats that I made. So when you're thinking about making a character, for example, you might go through many, many, many iterations where you're making variations until you get very close to the character. And even if you've got 50 versions that look close but not quite, you can then take those images, build a training model and get the character you're looking for with lots of different emotional states. And we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, tips to get a good emotional state, not just a flat image of a cat like you see here um, in a, just a few minutes. So uh, elements of the prompt, we talked a little bit about image prompts and, and we can do some of that together in Mid Journey or in Stable Diffusion in, in Dream Studio. It's very easy to do. You just upload the image you wanna use. Uh, next. Those text prompt descriptors, again, try to get your language down to something that is as few words as possible while painting the picture. And you're going to want to paint the picture from the foreground and what's most important to the background and what is sort of receding backward. Because if you think of the generator as giving the most time and attention to the first few words in your text prompt, you need to front load it. You need to put the most important things in the first few words because that's where it's going to focus most of its attention when it comes to the, the, the transformative process of running the diffusion model and making something for you. Basically, that, that creative 
uh, translation that is happening is based on how you have framed the prompt word by word. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you can modify how that is read. So algorithmic modifiers. When we're talking about the parameters at the end of a mid-journey prompt or in, in uh, Dream Studio, it's what's on the left side. Uh, the parameters are aspect ratio, uh, CFG, and, and they are, they're related to both quality and size and the output settings in some case. So in mid-journey, and this is something we're going to do right now because I want you to see this, you need to type in slash settings to get to what is the mid-journey experience of changing your settings to turn on remix. So we're going to do that right now. I do kind of like what I got out of here though. I'm not, I'm not sad about this. It's not what I'm looking for exactly, but like I said, you might want to take 50 images, take them out to another tool and then use those to train your existing, uh, for in this case, an architectural piece for a game. So here I'm going to skip ahead to where my message line is. I've gone to the bottom and I'm going to type settings so that you can see this with me. And when I type settings, hit return, it's going to deliver this uh, sort of matrix of things that I can change. And you can see right now I am in MJV4. Uh, some things only work in MJV3. You can see the, the, the suffix. The, the parameters there changed when I switched to MJV3. If I switch this to what they call Niji mode, which is more of an anime mode, um, that is also going to change the parameters. It's going to basically be querying to a different version of Midjourney. Midjourney, as you can see, has five different versions along with some test versions. I could try this test photo version as well. Um, I could say I want style extremely high and uh, I'm going to go with the uh, remix mode in particular. I want to keep on. This is something that we didn't talk too much about, but you need remix mode on if you want to be able to pop up and make those variations in real time. So when you hit V1, V2, V3, V4, if you're not getting the remix window to pop up, go to your settings, hit remix right here. You just have to toggle this on and off to turn it green. And then you're going to have that option. So at this point, I'm feeling good about what I've got. Maybe I want to go in and see what these are going to look like in a more anime version. So let's try a version of V2. And you can see in this case, I did get the remix. That's great. And I'm also going to do it with V3. And if you see me try more than one version, I'm sometimes doing A-B testing. I want to see what two different versions might look like. And then I might blend those two down the road, or I might, again, use them for a larger model. So by changing from what we had in version four to going to a different version, I might lose some of the resolution. It might become more sort of illustrative or cartoon-like. It might become, uh, in, you know, if I were using the Niji mode, for example, it might look like something out of an anime film um, or a video game, right? So we can see how much variation we've seen just in the last few versions. We really haven't changed the prompt much. I did get rid of a few words. But I wanted you to be able to see that by simplifying even just a few minutes and bringing it down, I was able to get to something. And I'll bring this up. You can see quite a bit of variation, even on the exact same composition, just by taking certain words out and then by remixing and doing more variations again. So in this point, I am in version four, but I thought I had turned on photo mode. So let's double check settings. And maybe I did, maybe I didn't. If you're finding that you need to go in and do these kinds of uh, sort of iterative tests, 
So right now I don't have version four turned on. I have MJ test photo. Um, version four tends to be the most lifelike, realistic. If you're looking for something that is closer to photorealism out of mid journey. Um, some people really love the stylized version of MJ V3 and some people are trying to create for anime. So that's where you would, would, would use that uh, Niji mode. So um, I'm going to go ahead and move back and take you through one tool I did not show you very quickly. Um, if you're new to MidJourney and you're looking for it, this is a reroll button. So if you're not happy with the four generations, you can just hit that and it's going to generate again. All right, so we're going to dive back into the slides. And I hope those of you who are with me here will ask questions if you need to. And please let me know where these pieces support your systems. All right, so forming aspect ratios. Um, at the end, those parameters, as we mentioned, you're using two hyphens and then AR to designate aspect ratio. Aspect ratio can be portrait or landscape. It could be something like 16 colon 9 or 3-2. Uh, these often relate to the aspect ratios of other publishing systems, right? So if you're trying to do a vertical reel, you might want to be in vertical, obviously from the get-go and generate your vertical images. Uh, if you follow me on Instagram or on YouTube, you might have seen some of those that I've created into reels uh, straight from mid-journey by uh, using a, a, a highly vertical uh, portrait mode, basically, um, saying that I want the aspect ratio to be uh, the same as a YouTube reel or a TikTok reel would be. So um, ratios are normalized. So you can use a pixel count or you can use a ratio. This is specific to, to uh, mid-journey. In Dream Studio, what you're just going to do is set the exact pixel count on the right side. Uh, some of the other tools will let you designate uh, down to the pixel how big you want that image to be. This is a tool that I want to give you very quickly. We're not going to spend too much time on it today, um, but I do want to encourage you to jump into this on your own time. Um, in the book, I do mention it as well. Uh, Shane developed Prompter Guide specifically as a, a relatively open source Google Doc of sorts. It's a template uh, that you can use to form your prompts from scratch. I'm going to encourage you to go over there to prompterguide.com where you can go and uh, there's a great deal of hidden language in Prompter Guide. So this URL here, the beginner's notes and the, the language of prompt craft in terms of if you're looking for a hundred different art styles and maybe what is the right language for you. Uh, I do have a video coming up that it, it helps catalog the art styles in a visual form, um, but I don't want you to feel constrained there are absolutely tools out there that just help you to understand what is that art style called and what will it look like on the other side. So there are Google Docs and we do have some of those in this presentation as well. If you need access to this presentation anytime, I hope you will reach out and let me know. So three elements of the prompt in mid-journey, image prompt, text prompt, and those parameters, right? So uh, we went through the parameters go at the end. They have two hyphens. You stick them at the back. Uh, you can use a negative prompt or a negative weight at that point. If you're trying to get something out of your image, in this case, it says no farms. Uh, that is a parameter to help create something uh, to take it out of your image to make sure that it doesn't get generated. Um, and now we're going to explore image prompts. Image prompts, or IMG to IMG, it is sometimes called, uh, particularly will generate based on one or more images. In this example, uh, from MidJourney, you will see that there are two images, a tulip one and a tulip two. This is how many people will do style transfers, uh, such as this style transfer of what was my headshot with uh, the sort of Star Trek universe, right? So thinking about a style transfer is often taking one or more images of a person or a place, something you're trying to generate on uh, as inspiration combined with a few words to make that prompt real. Um, in that case, I think it was, uh, it, it was like a headshot for, for Starfleet Academy, something very similar to that. Um, 
if you're trying to figure out how to frame these and, and form them well, uh, it helps to start with just a few words, as few words as possible. Don't overcomplicate it. If you need to create with image weights, uh, Dream Studio and many other tools on uh, Hugging Face, for example, will let you to do that. Um, within Midjourney, you may need to be in a specific version, for example, V3 of Midjourney, in order to use image weights. Uh, what image weights do is basically give more attention or more um, more weight, more more emphasis to the image. Uh, so that it knows whether you want to really focus on that and the details of that, or maybe you just want to include it, but don't necessarily need it as the, the fundamental piece of your project. So you're going to want to use image weights if you're trying to, for example, do a portrait that is very similar to someone specific and you don't want it to take too much artistic license. So other things you can do to play with that and be more abstract or artistic is to turn your style very high. Um, you can play with what they call CFG scale if you're in Dream Studio. Um, but there's a number of ways you can sort of explore different versions as well in, in mid-journey to uh, try and get something that looks more or less human. For example, this was for a, a mock-up of a memorial for someone uh, who was a Vietnam War veteran in Oakland. So if you're trying to figure out how to get to photorealism and it's not quite getting there, um, you may not be able to get there in the tool that you're using. And so uh, Midjourney has gotten a lot better at photorealism over the last few months, but it is not ideal yet. And I just want to give you some, some preface to say that uh, if you're trying to get to photorealism and it's not quite working for you yet, go ahead and try playing with those image weights or go to a different tool. Try Leonardo AI or Playground AI um, or some of the tools on Hugging Face. Uh, Automatic 1111 is an option if you're using Stable Diffusion. Uh, and some folks are using ControlNet, for example, to do some of this problem solving as well. I uh, posted a headshot recently from ControlNet that was quite amazing and bizarre. <laughs> so um, your mileage may vary. I, we don't cover these in the in, in the intro course, but you can absolutely go to any number of the AI tools we cover in the videos at Reality Craft so that you can find those. One thing I really want to prompt you on in your own work is to send the envelope emoji if you are in Mid journey, and I'm going to do this for you right now so that you see me do it and you understand exactly what I'm talking about. So, we're going to go back to the mid journey bot and talk to it real quick. And I want it to okay, so maybe I really like this image, I think it's cool. I'm down, I, I want to save it, and basically, I'm going to keep it in my prop locker or my, my notebook. So, um, whether you're using something like prompter guide or you're keeping track of your your favorite prompts and, and what we call seeds, uh, you're going to want to have a place where you track those. So I'm going to do this thing called the envelope emoji right there. And by it, by sending that envelope emoji to the Discord bot, it is now sending me the job ID, which is a unique identifier for this image, and then the seed. And the seed is also a reference point for being able to come back and work with a specific type of composition. Uh, so if I'm doing, for example, a graphic novel where I need to keep some consistency amongst my settings, uh, the seed and then generating on the same seed can help to make that easier. Uh, Midjourney is improving how seeds are managed and you know, what was possible a couple of weeks ago and before is now possible. Uh, so you, your mileage may vary in terms of whether you're able to get seeds to get you to a consistent building. Uh, in the advanced topics course, we cover a tool called scenario.gg for training models. And that might be, for example, a way to solve for consistency over time. Uh, it, let's say you make a bank of 50 to 100 of your favorite images here. Um, once you've, for example, taken that seed 
data and then keep creating based on that, then you are going to be able to have something that has a very similar look and feel. At this point, I'm probably not going to change the prompt much unless I'm looking for something very specific. Let's say I needed a person at the doorway, then I would go ahead and add a person at the doorway. But I might say that some of these other variations could be used for a remix. So then let's say human in doorway. And let's see if I can get that. So again, if it's most important to my picture, I'm going to want to put it in the front. If I need that human to show a specific emotion, I might want to use an emoji to do that. And there's a couple of different ways you can do that. But in the remix of the prompt, you can just add an emotion to say human screaming, <laughs> right? And so it understands what emotional state to attach to the human. So we'll go back and take a look at those in just a few moments and see what we got. But um, I wanted to show you sort of an example. This was a prototype for an early poster and uh, uh, part of a larger set of things. But I wanted you to see the, the, the formation of a complex prompt because uh, in this case, the conference organizer, who is an uh, amazing uh, woman in, um, in Atlanta, I want to say, if I hope I've gotten that right, uh, runs a solar punk uh, conference. And so was trying to express a very specific idea um, that is rather complex with a poster. And so we were spinning off different ideas in concept development. Uh, half of these words came from her. And then the, the front words, the photo, vibrant, prismatic futures poster, right? That is the um, the, the basic, like, what is that content that I'm looking for? And that sets up the rest of her description, which is that solar punk portal that black people are in the front, like showing exactly what that community needs to look like. And then I included the word poster twice because I didn't want it to forget. And sometimes you might want to repeat the same word twice if it's that vitally important. So these kinds of things are going to help you refine and, and great to see that comment. Thank you uh, for your comments. I really appreciate those as well. So uh, some of these tools we can absolutely take a look at. Um, there is a great uh, guide to, um, uh, sorry, I'm going to go back very quickly for you before we jump ahead. So um, I can send you the, the whole slide deck with all of these links, but I would encourage you to go into the get book on the journey. Um, there are a number of great Google Docs that help you understand art styles. So if you're looking for that art style guide, uh, I just got my envelope emoji through the door. That's great. So uh, <laughs> thank you all. And uh, if you're looking for specific tutorials around certain types of things, there are a handful of creators I'm going to recommend here. Uh, one of them is Eratem Art. Um, uh, they've got a, the Black Label Art Cult and such. And then also uh, the next gentleman we're going to take a look at, uh, Olivier Sarkis. So um, if you're looking for those kinds of in-depth tutorials, there are a handful of YouTubers who do that specific thing for free. And I'm going to encourage you to go check out Olivier's videos. Uh, he's lovely and seems to be very knowledgeable as a designer and artist. Um, and uh, you're going to find that in some of these videos that they will walk you through step by step. But I wanted you to notice something very specific about his prompt craft here uh, because it might help you refine something you're trying to do. So he's framed something very interesting, right? House, most important thing, from the 1929 year. He put 1929 before the word year. Um, the word 1929 without the word year makes no sense to Midjourney. But if you put year 1929, it might not also make sense of it, right? So you have to almost talk like Yoda at times. 1929, then year, helps to create a, a very clear reference point that Midjourney is able to then turn into a consistent image. Now, the isometric illustration, that is a very interesting type of art that you can try in your experimentation. Uh, if you're a game developer trying to do these kind of isometric gameplay boards, uh, this is how game developers build content very quickly. You can make 200 images, make a game map, and then weave them all together. Same with what's happening here. 
the descriptor is very simple. Three words, young, handsome man. You know, there might need to be a few more words in there. He has hazel eyes or something. I Hazel eyes are, are one of those things that have been very difficult to do. Um, you might need to give, you know, specific prompts that help define the person that's in this picture. Um, but then there's that... Uh, style note, again, typography art. And this did something really interesting and beautiful, even though Midjourney doesn't speak a specific language and the words don't necessarily look like anything. They look like, you know, nothing. They look like golf duke. So um, I want you to practice as you're going through. What you just saw didn't have the parameters. It did have the V4 at the end. So those are parameters as well. But um, try and get to a place where you can write a prompt in like 10 to 12 words that satisfies all of these things. This is where practice makes perfect. It takes time and you're not going to get it right the first time. But as you experiment, you're going to find that you can drop uh, the words we use in the English language, like A and the very uh, there's so many of them such. <laughs> we use lots of words that are just not that useful. So I want you to think about necessarily, uh, we are going to look very briefly at ChatGPT. And as we do that, uh, ChatGPT is lovely, but it's very wordy. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to preface uh, what what we're going to talk about with ChatGPT to say um, it, it's not always the best choice, and it's important to think about when you're trying to figure out the right tool for the right job that you know maybe the tool that everyone else is using is not the right tool for you right now. Um, so that's where making some qualified choices will help you in your prompt craft as a whole. Um, and it's okay to experiment and explore and then step back because it might not be the right thing for you. So uh, we are inside chat GPT right now. And I wanted to show you just a little bit of what that looks like. Um, chat GPT has a light mode and a dark mode. We're going to stick to dark mode right now. I think it's just a little easier on me personally, but you can choose. Um, as you can see, I have been asking it to do some pretty interesting uh, uh, hacks. I, I wanted it to write YouTube content, things like this. So um, when I'm using the, the sort of basic language of prompt craft in an image tool, that is going to be completely different than what I'm going to do in a chat tool. So when I'm in a chat tool like ChatGPT, my language has to be different. I have to use words like write, describe, enumerate, list, uh, explain, right? These are very different verbs that make no sense in mid-journey because mid-journey needs an action word. Otherwise, it doesn't know what to do. So mid-journey can take emotions, like an emoji or a, a description of an emotion. It can even take a concept, uh, but it doesn't know what to do with, uh, with uh, explain enumerate, uh, all of those kinds of things it doesn't have language for because those are a different type of language. They're different types of words. Uh, they do different things. So those commands are specific to something like ChatGPT. ChatGPT has its own language. It has multiple language sets that you can ask about. And some people have done that uh, with varying results, uh, both ethically and otherwise in public. So I'm going to encourage you to make some qualified decisions about how you want to engage uh, with chatbots as a whole. Um, I have certainly used ChatGPT to experiment and explore with uh, writing. In this case, it was writing for YouTube. So I released a tutorial yesterday on the advanced topics course, as we talked about earlier. I wanted to see what kinds of descriptions it would write. Now, it thinks that I should be teaching TensorFlow and PyTorch, and that wasn't really what I was going for. So in that case, I needed to rewrite that same description. And then I used the word rewrite. Now, ChatGPT can remember, at least in this conversation, what we just talked about. So if I tell it that the first answer wasn't good enough, it will then regenerate a response. And you can see right here, regenerate response. So I asked it to write a channel description. Uh, maybe that was okay, but not quite what I needed. Then I can click regenerate response. 
if I just want to start a whole new conversation, I can either come up here and edit what I was working on. So write a YouTube description for the introduction to PromptCraft webinar with Evo at ReallyCraft. And that would be the baseline of the very minimum. Now, ChatGPT wants more information than that. And right now it's giving me an error because I am basically, it, it thinks I'm not logged in. Uh, once you've kept the window sort of static for some period of time, it's just not even going to answer you anymore. So we can start again. We can say right here to the bottom line. And this is where you would prompt when you get started. And you can see the kinds of language it wants, but it also warns you that it might be incorrect. It doesn't have the full web at its disposal. It's not updated all the time, right? So it is limited in its knowledge. It is not the news. So asking it to explain current events is not a good use case for this, for example. So write a YouTube description for the introduction to PromptCraft workshop with Evo at RealityCraft. And let's see what it gives us. And you can see that it will sort of do this almost real-time typing. Um, it is trying to think about what should be in the video because it doesn't know. And in this case, I might need to go back and tell it what's in the video, right? So I can go here, I can tell it whether that's a good or a bad answer. I can also come in here and refine the same way I was remixing in, in mid-journey. This allows me to refine in chat GPT and say, write a YouTube description for the introduction to PromptCraft workshop with Evo at RealityCraft that describes how the language of prompt writing is changing. So let's see if it's able to come up with something that makes sense here. Um, ChatGPT is very wordy. It has a very specific structure. It tends to put things in four or five paragraph chunks. In this case, it's given me a four paragraph YouTube description. It has a specific length it knows those are. So do I think this is well written? It's not bad. Um, it doesn't have all of my favorite keywords in it, but it's okay. And that gives me at least a starting point. Never, ever, ever consider whatever comes out of a generator to be your final work. I'm just going to preface that and say that right now, it doesn't matter what the generator is. Never, ever, ever, ever consider a generator to be your final work. Um, as the Copyright Office uh, has shown us in the U.S. this week, uh, that is not enforceable as a copyright currently. So uh, you need to make work your own. What does it mean to make work your own? Uh, in this case, this is the first book I did in uh, Mid Journey using a series of prompts that were mostly emoji prompts. I was capturing the stories of the Magrathians from uh, Douglas Adams uh, uh, stories. Uh, I was specifically trying to uh, bring forward new characters that I hadn't seen before. And so I was using Mid Journey to do the conceptual development. Now, you have to then take those images out and upscale them and edit them, you know, whether that's watermarking or denoising or getting them to a place where you feel like they're ready to print. Uh, where I found Mid Journey was limited was that you can only upscale to a certain point and then you're going to need to take those to another sort of external upscaling program. Uh, Topaz is one. There are a handful of web based upscalers that will give you maybe 10 or 15 upscales even a week. Uh, so I would encourage you to go check those out. Some of them will also be baked into programs that you already potentially have, uh, such as Adobe Creative Suite. So can you get to a published book? Yes, it takes. Um, you know, two to four weeks from going into the generative process. And I would say realistically, when uh, I've now done three books using mid journey art, plus my other writing and my other concept work, I am spending at least an hour per page because I spend a fair amount of time in editing. So if you're trying to think about putting together a 48 page book, please give yourself 
proper editing time. Don't think of it as an immediate process that doesn't really work. You can do something very affordable, right? So that was a month of mid journey time. And I, I went ahead and print two hardcover copies to see the quality. It cost under a hundred dollars to run that experiment to publish a hardcover book. So hopefully that gives you some preface into how some of these tools can be used in your own work. Uh, if you're finding that you want to take that deeper with me, we can absolutely schedule a session together. I do both private consults and then we can also live stream those too if you find that that's meaningful and useful for your community to come and do it live with me together. So we meet live, remotely, hybrid, all together. Uh, my gallery here in Oakland is also open to you. We can support teams of up to about 16 people here in Oakland. Uh, if you'd like to try Design Lab or you'd like to collaborate on building a training program together, uh, whether that's a concept development project you're working on internally or you want to work together on something for your community, uh, please reach out and let me know where I can support you. And I'm going to encourage you to join the Reality Craft Group, uh, whether that's on Facebook or on LinkedIn. Now, Reality Craft is a public group currently, but it will be closed at some point to those who are subscribers and members only. So if you are not yet a subscriber and member, I'm going to encourage you to hit the subscribe button right now. Uh, there are going to be additional coursework options available to subscribers only in the future. So that said, I definitely want to invite you to come and hang out. Let us know where we can collaborate, whether that's workshopping with you or bringing tools into your team so that you have a better workflow in hand for your next projects. I do a fair amount of strategy guide, uh, early stage consults. I'm a 25 year interactive producer with a great deal of experience across media types. So radio, television, games, film, interactives of all types, live streams, obviously, whatever that needs to look like for you, let me know. And if you're trying to figure out concept creative for uh, physical objects, that is also something I am starting to collaborate with other artists around the world who've uh, nailed down fabrication processes. And we also have a physical building shop. So if you need help building and bringing these worlds to life in large scale, uh, we have experiential designers, we have fabricators who come from special effects and the Hollywood media industries who can work with you to build those things and make them real. So please reach out. Anything you want to bring to the design table, just let me know. We can solve for that together. I am happy to work with you on any of these challenges, and I want you to feel like you can bring your questions to the table too. So I'm going to go ahead and come back into our stream here in just a moment. It's great to see you. If you have any specific questions, I hope you're going to reach out. I don't usually wear a gown, uh, had an award ceremony right before this. So thank you for uh, reaching out, letting me know. I appreciate your comments and questions. Feel free to drop those in here and let us know where we can support you. You can reach out to me at my website, which is EVO. Dot .ist. I'm going to make that just a little bit bigger for all of you who are uh, maybe like me and are, are having those vision troubles as middle age hits. So evo.ist, if you would like to reach out to me, that is a great place to start. And then I am happy to work with you here in the design lab where that makes sense. So from all of us here, I just want to encourage you to let me know where these types of processes support you. I'm going to go ahead and cut the stream in just a few minutes. Uh, we do have a little bit of time left to go through some, some tools very quickly. So I'm going to see if I can bring in one more screen for you. Um, I've been exploring both uh, the, the sort of skyboxing experiences in, in these uh 360 worlds such as blockade and you can go to some of the other videos on my channel and those are going to help you find those as well. Um, I want to make sure that we, I don't think it's going to work today. No, maybe not. So this is what happens. I've got so many windows up for you today. We've been exploring. I'm going to be doing a video a little bit later on today that includes a number of the generative video tools. So if you've been waiting for those generative video tools to be available, uh, check out the video with AugX Labs on my channel. That is where you're going to go to find a a free code for a free video with them. Um, I would definitely encourage you to do that as well. Uh, let's see. 
I think the skybox may or may not be working, but we're going to give it a shot because I've been having a lot of fun in the skybox. So let's see if we can do it. I would love to hear what types of things you want to work on in the future. So if these kinds of topics are interesting to you and you're trying to figure out how to build your project or you're trying to figure out what tool you need and maybe you need a tutorial on something very specific, I hope you'll reach out. Uh, what we're looking at right now, and I'm gonna go to full screen because it's just so pretty in here. It's kind of fun. Uh, this is something called Skybox Labs. Uh, Skybox from Blockade Labs, sorry. Uh, Skybox.blockade labs.com. I'm going to go ahead and put that URL up for you. But this is a prompt craft space where I am able to both write a prompt. In this case, I've got a, a scene of crystalline a landscape with gems. And I can give it a style. In this case, it's got certain art styles that it wants. So interior views, dreamlike, sci-fi, realistic, digital painting. So um, I'm going to go for a scenic one and let's see if it's going to generate for me. These take a little bit longer as we were describing earlier. When you're working in something like Mid Journey, it's giving you, you know, 256 to 512 pixels on the first time out. Uh, this is giving a much bigger output. So it takes some time to render and really get that generative output to come together. Um, but these things look really cool when you pull them into other 3D worlds. So I'm going to pull myself out and that way you can see all of this. And if you're looking for this tool, by the way, it's skybox.blockadelabs.com. Um, they're really lovely. I, I had not encountered them until very recently, but they're working really hard to keep their tools up and running. Um, as I know, a lot of you have been testing with them this week. I'm going to show you really quick what some of their skyboxes look like. So this is what a, a skybox that you could pull into a 3D world would look like as a backdrop, right? So it's delivered as a single image, but then you would then bring that into maybe Unity, maybe a tool like Spatial, or um, I was testing my gallery in framevr.io where I could then see all of my different environments in one place. So these are some of the skyboxes that I generated the other day. Um, it's really fun to play with this. Uh, and thank you for all of these amazing questions and inquiry points. It's really great to hear from all of you. Um, those of you who are asking about 3D generative worlds, uh, there are some interesting tools coming out in the coming year. And it will be interesting to see who gets there first. So uh, I'm going to bring this question right up. Are 3D generative landscapes available? We are going to absolutely be following up with a number of these tools because they're getting there. And ooh, my crystalline flowers really got crystalline. Ooh. So I am, oh, neat. All right, well, I'm going to download that one. That's fascinating. It looks like some sort of fantasy paradise. But then I can then go ahead and send these to my friends who work in the XR industry. And I can say, hey, do we want to use this as the skybox for our new WebXR world. Maybe we're building a cool hangout and uh, maybe I like this, but I want it to have that nebula effect instead. So I'm going to regenerate with a nebula and I want you to see what some of these style choices are going to do for you. So uh, the, the short answer to MTV's question is uh, not yet and soon. Uh, 3D generative landscapes are certainly out within the machine learning community. Uh, if you go to places like Hugging Face, you're going to find a wide variety of sort of metaverse applicable uh, different tools and plugins that are in the experimental phase, as well as those that have been around for a couple of years. Uh, so if you're looking for hybrids between the generators we've seen today, let's say Stable Diffusion, with another toolkit, uh, you might want to try Hugging Face to start. Uh, Hugging Face is a 
uh, relatively open community that uh, tool builders can use and share their tools effectively along with models and data sets. So uh, that is a place for those who are interested in machine learning in prompt engineering specifically, not just prompt craft and writing, but also in how do you uh, really manipulate models and data sets. We, we do talk about some of this in the advanced topics course as well. So here's what we got off of that nebula. You can see, I mean, this is like an outer space skybox, like deep in VR chat kind of thing, which absolutely you could use these kinds of things in VR chat as well. Um, I'm really excited to see that their generation time in blockade has gotten down quite a bit. So uh, even a week or two ago, this was not nearly as easy as it is right now. So um, I will, uh, bring up, actually, someone was asking for the prompt that is in Blockade right now, a uh, crystalline wide open field of crystal flowers, vibrant spectrum, prismatic faceted gems. So not much flowery here, but we do get obviously that sort of bright crystalline vibe amongst the stars. And I think that's that's an interesting approach. It's not necessarily what I was looking for, but it's that, that's why you experiment, right? So um, Blockade Labs, it says it can take up to 400 characters in the prompt, and I'm using 87 right now at uh, 10 words, right? So your mileage may vary. You might be able to get 50 words in there. I have not seen that this thing can generate all of that. Uh, so again, front load, make sure that the most important things are in the front of your prompt and, uh, really help it to understand the difference between your foreground and your background, if you're trying to use these tools. So I'm really excited. I, I don't know that that strikes me as surreal, but I like it. I'm kind of, I'm curious what sci-fi is though. <laughs> So these are the kinds of things that time and experimentation will help you to gain. So I don't want you to feel burdened by choosing like whether these kinds of tools are right for you. What we're looking at right now, this is a uh, skybox at Blockade Labs. This is one of those tools we also cover in advanced topics because it's for those of you who are world builders, who are into XR, or maybe you're making a game world in, in some place. So uh, these kinds of backgrounds, skyboxes, 360 images uh, can be quite portable across the 3D web. And we'll talk more about the, the future of the 3D web and the open metaverse and how all of these generative tools fit together with that in a future cast. So I want to encourage you to keep those questions coming. Uh, some of you I will probably ask to interview along the way. So if you are hearing me now and you want to be a part of that process, we've started dropping the new reality cast as well. And if you go to my channel, which is at Evo Reality Craft on YouTube, that's going to have the reality cast. It includes some cool demos, interviews, uh, some of my walkthroughs with new tools, uh, directories of where to go to find the right tools. So any of that information, I would encourage you to go over there and subscribe as well. So uh, thanks to all of you who've been joining me here and there and everywhere. I'm going to drop out at this point and thank you for being a part of today's webinar. If I can support you in any way on any of this work, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my info right here, it's evo.ist for the web. And I do want to encourage you to go ahead and pick up the book as well. It is now on ebook. It is on Kindle. It is also out in paperback. So if that's interesting to you, uh, the whole book will really help you think about all of these ideas and how they fit together. That is Promcraft Guidebook. It is now on Amazon. So please reach out if I can support you in any way with future trainings and projects. And let me know if you've got concepts for a future cast, because I would love to hear them. Thank you from all of us here at Reality Craft. It has been wonderful to be here with you today. I'm going to take you out with just a little bit more from the book. And thank you for joining me here. Have a beautiful day.